So welcome to the live panel. Well, not quite so live panel on early period costuming. And I've invited some friends to come and talk about their particular history geek. And I'm gonna let them introduce themselves starting with Vesta. Hello, I'm Vesta Antonia Aurelia. I'm in Ontier if you're a Skadian, uh, the West Coast if you're not Skadian. Um, I focus on Minoan times. So that's the uh, the culture of Bronze Age Crete and the island Santorini. Awesome. And if you could be a movie character, who would that be? Oh God, I thought about this and none of them. They all have very, very interesting lives and I do not want to have their interesting lives. <laughs> that is totally fair. Way too interesting. <laughs> okay, Yulia. Well, my name is Sarah Erdahl, and I have gone by Yulia Sempronia, Yulila Sempronia, for people who have really known me a long time, since, oh, the mid-1990s, way before I started playing in the SCA. Uh, my focus is, my current focus is late antiquity, fifth century from, from the, the start uh, to as long as I live. Uh, I'll be researching that. Um, and gosh, movie characters, I, you know, I had high hopes of being evil when I was two, but I've never been able to, to manage that. But I would love to be Sion Phillips playing Livia Augusta in I, Claudius. That's a good one. I like it. <laughs> I think I'm going to go with Professor Gonegal because she can turn into a cat. <laughs> and, and can you mention the hairballs? Uh, well, you know, be, since I'm Professor McGonagall, I, I would be able to handle um, going to the apothecary so that I didn't have to worry about hairballs. A magical cat. <laughs> yeah. And uh, to introduce myself, hi, I'm Althea Rizzo, and in the SCA, I am Suviophilia Heriberti, where I do sixth century Merovingian. Uh, costuming and research. And that is from about the uh, 5th century to about the 8th century in France, Netherlands, Switzerland, and bits of Germany. It was a culture that was a bridge between the Roman era and what we can uh, start to consider really the early medieval period. And it's, it's really a lot of fun to do research in. So how we're going to play this is uh, I'm going to ask my dear friends questions they're going to answer. And let's just kick into it. Are you guys ready? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so okay. so uh, we're going to start with Vesta and then we'll go to uh, Sarah. And then uh, first question is, when and where is your research focus? Um, it's mostly centered on the Minoan culture on Crete and Thera, although in order to understand them, it's sort of uh, got a little bigger and has expanded to the Bronze Age because you can't really understand a culture in isolation. You have to talk to their trade partners. And so Bronze Age Egypt and Bronze Age Mesopotamia and Bronze Age Mainland Greece, and then also including down in Bronze Age India, where there was a whole other culture, which completely fascinates me. Um, so it's the Bronze Age world, but mostly focused on the Minoans. Excellent. Sarah? Um, my focus is, it started out uh, early Principate, uh, around two, 250, and then uh, in 2005, I focused on the, the fifth century uh, in, Britain in Gaul and the the Italian peninsula, and that that encompasses uh, habitat, you know, daily life, cuisine, uh, uh, and uh, economics. Particularly since the fifth century is is rapidly falling apart, and and economic trade routes are being disrupted. Stop me if this sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. The more things change, the more they say the same. That is very true. 
And then for myself, uh, I studied the Merovingian period. And like I said earlier, that's from about fifth to uh, eighth century. And it is a culture that, that tried to um, bridge the Roman, a lot of their political structure, their social structure was very Roman still. They had a great bureaucracy that was still based on Roman law. But a lot of the aesthetics of the Germanic people um, and the Lex Salica with the Germanic laws, they kind of had a way of blending them together. And so that's my research focus. So I concentrate mostly on uh, clothing. I also am very interested in the botany and the agronomy and gardening of the period. You know, what did they eat? How did they grow it? Um, you know, what what kind of linens did they grow? What kind of sheep did they have? There was a lot of really interesting um, advancements in you know, wool and sheep around that time that uh, really played into later periods that benefited from that, that work that the Romans brought that really lovely wool um, to the area. So the next question is, what did they wear? Well, you can see behind me, Ta-da! this is uh, um, my model of the, uh, uh, my take on the the snake priestess, sometimes known as snake goddess, is a little little figurine about oh, about this big, and she's got her snakes up, you know, and her boobs are hanging out, but we won't talk about that. Um, but she's got the snakes up, and she's got the hat with the cat. Uh, but this is my interpretation of her gown. Uh, the Minoan women, um, for their ceremonies, because we really don't have a lot of information on what they wore, you know, what their t-shirt and jeans was, um, but they wore this long gown, and then they wore either an apron or um, on other islands, they had a, um, a wrap skirt that they wore around their hips uh, as well. So there's a couple where they're just wearing the plain gown as well. So bihanos, which is what the later Greeks called it, long dress, and then either a, an apron like this or a wrapped skirt. And uh, sometimes they wore uh, funky things in their hair, but sometimes they just wore their hair down. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Sarah? What did the Romans wear? Well, in the fifth century is interesting because it's it's a transitional period in some respects, though uh, Coptic garments became uh, ascendant in, in fashions starting uh, in the late second century. Uh, and anybody who's familiar with, with, uh, with Coptic garments, there are uh, lots of decorations, uh, vertical stripes and roundels uh, everywhere, uh, heavily decorated um, for both men and women. Uh, and occasionally, mostly in, in really formal settings, you'll see some of those classical uh, styles uh, in for, for men, uh, the togas, though the toga had shrunk, luck, luckily for them and women still were, were gar garmented in a fairly classical style for formal portraits. But that continued to evolve throughout the fifth century uh, and, and rapidly became what, what we tend to associate with. with Garments were, were large because linen doesn't take dye well. Uh, Coptic garments were generally with a linen background uh, with tablet woven, brilliantly colored wool bands woven in. And luckily for us, there are still a lot of fragmentary finds that, that shil still show the brilliance of those colors. Interesting thing uh, with this period too, Christianity is largely ascendant though there were still pockets of, of uh, pagans here and there, but the forms that, uh, of the decoration continued to be classical for a long time after uh, pagan uh, worships had largely died out. So does that period kind of run into the time period when um, Theodoric uh, was building, when the Ravenna uh, churches were being built, so they had well, those beautiful mosaics? 
those were uh, in the in the Ravenna, the ones that we think of right away were sixth century. However, um, the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore in in Rome has fabulously gorgeous fifth century mosaics, which, if you take a careful look, uh, give give us a whole lot of uh, sources for how the the fashions of the times were portrayed. Excellent, thank you. And uh, for Merovingians, um, they they had mostly for their clothing, uh, Germanic traditional clothing. Uh, women wore uh, early on, you know, it started off with the peplos with the two brooches, uh, but that quickly became uh, what they call the, the, the two and the four brooch system, where the under tunic would be um, uh, where the under tunic would be clasped with two small brooches and then they would wear a, a caftan or coat over it and that would be closed with with two brooches and then by the end of the, uh, the era closer to the eighth century they had pretty much adopted Byzantine wear which was um, a you know a tunic that was fairly shapeless they usually had one large brooch with a lot of ornamentation, but they had pretty much adopted the Byzantine uh, clothing by the end of the era. And most of their textiles that they produced were produced in a Germanic tradition. So you had a lot of twills, a lot of wools, um, and they used linen quite a bit. But especially in the higher uh, elite grave goods, you see a lot of textiles that came in from Byzantine uh, workshops or even Chinese um, sources. Uh, there was one grave where Arnegund, uh, who was a queen in the late fifth, late sixth century, early, yeah, late sixth century. I always get mixed up on those. Late sixth century, and she was a queen um, and was mother of the future king and she was buried with a, a caftan that had a samite on it that definitely came from byzantine workshops and the the samite was over embroidered with a gold uh, thread the wrap around a, a silver co a silk core and so most of their their uh, textiles were from the Germanic uh, traditions, but you know they did have high-level exchanges of gifts, especially you know at the royal level. So um, Vesta, when you're when you're looking at some of the artworks um, that depict the uh, clothing of the era, are there are there specific frescoes or things that that you could look to? for for guidance i i i do the most of the most of the time people people look at the palace of Knossos and they look at it and they're like oh we've got all these frescoes and this is fabulous and the problem with that is not only that it was uh burned and then rebuilt and burned and rebuilt and then you know painted over and painted over but also when the guy excavated it in the early 20th century it seems really weird to say the early 20th century, the early 1900s. Yeah. Um, he he had some ideas of what he was supposed to find. And so he found it. And if he didn't find it, he made it. And so I actually don't look at Iconosis um, as, a, as a legitimate, serious source, because there's just so much that we've imposed later on it. Uh, I think that the island of uh, Pesera, P-S-E-I-R-A, -E uh, where they've only found two fragmentary ones, but nobody's messed with those other than trying to piece them back together. And uh, the island of Santorini, where they have the excavation of a little town called Akrotiri, and the frescoes there are amazing, because it was buried uh, kind of like Pompeii and Herculaneum. It was, buried in a volcanic eruption and so there's this like end date and then everything got sealed in this very desiccating um volcanic material um 
it wasn't it wasn't covered with lava it was just sort of buried in this powdery white stuff that sucked all the moisture out of everything um and so the frescoes just sit there and they're they're still really brilliantly colored um considering how long they've been sitting there um and so you have to be careful with the with the art because uh, a lot of it a lot of it has to be taken with a grain of salt and knowing that what you're seeing isn't complete um, and that we don't have the context to understand some of the details that are going on because we can't even read their language yet you know we haven't translated it there's not enough for us to be able to understand what they're saying it's intriguing but really frustrating challenging but fun but challenging but fun okay <clears throat> so, Vesta, why did you choose this era to study? Uh, uh, challenging but fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I, I, I don't remember why, uh, but in the mid ninth, the mid nineteen nineties, um, I got in, I got entranced in it, and uh, it just sort of sat in the background. It percolated for me for for years now, um, going on three decades. Uh, the the thing I love about it is that it it never stays the same because you know there's there's so much that isn't agreed on um, because we get this new tech all the time and so uh, they look at new excavations or they go and look at old artifacts and they run it through I don't know different wavelengths of light and have the computer evaluate what it's seeing which is how we found hidden colors in the frescoes or um, they're using the the lidar and, and the and the the ground penetrating radar, and they're finding um, new uh, new palaces, palaces, administrative centers, new buildings, new temples buried under rock, rubble, and, and and pumice. And they're you know they're able to chemically extract the contents, the dried up crusted contents of the bottom of uh, of a of a food jar that's been sitting in in one of the 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 structures for you know literally 3,000 years and so they can tell us hey you know this there was olive oil in here so that backs up the domesticated domestication of the olive to 3,000 BCE at least thank you uh Sarah what what drew you to that era well <laughs> Prepare for story time, which because I <laughs> often wind up telling a lot of stories because um, it, it's it's convoluted. When I was growing up in Springfield, Oregon, of course it was rainy, uh, and oftentimes we got to go to the library and listen to the librarian read stories from the Greek and and Norse myths, which were wonderful, and probably planted my love of history. Then when I was a sophomore in college, I had the opportunity to study abroad in Salzburg, Austria, and was able to travel both with my class and, and uh, on my own a great deal. So I, I got to go, go down to Greece and, and swim in Homer's wine dark sea and, and uh, walk the streets of Rome. And, and it it's, was a turning point for me. So I've, I've studied and read about the period for a long time. Then I read a novel by Colleen McCullough in the early 1990s called The First Man in Rome. A very fictionalized version of, of the, the late Republican area. And about the same time I discovered the internets. Remember those AOL discs that they used to send you? So I jumped on and started typing in Roman Forum uh, and, and Ancient Rome, and up pops something on the, the line of, what, of what's behind me, a 3D uh, virtual reality rendering of the Roman Forum and in, in the old time Warner, Warner Pathfinder site. And a couple of professors had created this, this interactive mystery game where you wander around the, the Roman Forum as it downloaded 14.4 VOD modem. 
And I was totally enthralled because it, 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 took, it took reading history to, to being part of it. So ultimately, I, I wound up being a remote site administrator for the, the community that grew up around this. And then when the dot-com bust happened in about 10 years later, I was hunting around for something else. Uh, I discovered a community called Nova Roma, which is how I met Dasta. So long ago. <laughs> uh, loved, loved the focus on history, uh, hated the lack of sense of humor. So I wound up uh, going to, uh, I was taking a Latin class and, and went to uh, a, a demo that was sponsored by a, a local group to the north. So I had been, while I was a remote site administrator, I'd been studying for years and years about how Romans lived their daily lives um, in the, the early part of, of the Principate, 100 to 200. Uh, so I, I made myself a website. I, I wrote a lot of articles about how what people wore, uh, but the SCA gave me a focus for that. Well, jumping ahead, I, I participated in a persona challenge called the Tournament of Golden Swan in, in, in 0506. And I had to pick a persona that was at least uh, based in, in 450 of the common era. So I thought, well, I'm not really interested in late antiquity, but I really want to do this, this persona challenge. So I started cracking his books on late antiquity and seeing what I could find. And just as I always intended to go back to the second century, but, but the more I read about late antiquity, the, and uh, a lot like Vesta, it's, it's such a challenge when you, you have a period that's much less well-documented than the classical Roman era. So here I stay. <laughs> and for me, um, it, I kind of agree with, you know, Vesta, it was uh, a challenge. Um, when I first got interested in this, I was just starting to work on my doctoral research. And I wanted something that wasn't related to my doctoral research so that I could kind of blow off steam and study this other thing. And I found um, a book somewhere that had talked about the Merovingians and how difficult it was to study their clothing because we don't have a lot of extant garments. We don't have a lot of uh, illustration. We don't have a lot of paintings of it. And so I go, oh, that'll be fun. That'll be a challenge. And you know, the more I learned, the more I was interested in it and just got fascinated with the politics of the time. Um, they were, they were sometimes not very nice people. <laughs> there was a lot of, a lot of family aside uh, going on at the royal levels there. Wait, 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 is this the era where they have the two queens who hated each other? Um, there was one, yes. There was, um, God, I like, forget their names. Uh, Frig Frigamanda and Grindus or something. Yeah. And they hated each other and they kept trying to kill each other. Yep, yep, yep. I yep. love that. And years and years. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's just so much that was going on at that time and like i said the more i learned you know it's this transition period from uh late roman but you got the addition of the germanic traditions and then out of this uh, cauldron came charlemagne and you know his golden era and the uh, basically starting to create the nation states uh, that emerged later on in the medieval and uh, later periods. And one of the difficult things um, about this period is, is everything's in a foreign language. Uh, and when I started doing this research, you know, there was no such thing as Google Translate. And it was it was literally, you know, okay, it's German. So, okay, here's my German English dictionary. <laughs> and a lot of times you oh. don't find the exact word. So 
bless you Google for Google Translate. Right. So for, for me, it's the it's it's not even in the same alphabet. <laughs> it's in Greek. I feel yeah. the same. So that's that's kind of how I got into it. You know, it's just a challenging era. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I kind of also liked the the Sogbian era, which is at the same time there, but over in the steppes area and um, upper central Asia in that area. Mostly because the women wore pants then. <laughs> and so I said, I'm down with that. And they had the <laughs> best textiles. Oh my gosh, the silks that the Sogbians produced was just all of the colors uh and and so yeah that's kind of how i got into the merovingian let's find one of the most difficult periods to study with no resources <laughs> and very few extant garments uh mostly what we know from the textiles is is when you have a textile against a metal um in uh in in sight and basically the, the textile becomes mineralized and that preserves the, the weave and the structure really well, but you only get you know millimeters and, and centimeters worth of material. You can't tell much from uh, a, about a garment from <laughs> that. Uh, so we use a lot of, uh, you know, where was the brooch placed? You know, because that will be an opening and uh, so there's been a couple of great studies that have looked at the evolution of where those brooches are and, and how the different systems, uh, you know, were this one system was popular in this one area of Europe, this other system was popular, and then they just all kind of grew into that Byzantine style, which was the one brooch at the throat. Cool. Okay, so the next question is, what is your favorite part of this era? Well, I have to say for the Minoans, uh, the fact they had uh, flushy toilets and running water. <laughs> uh, the, the interesting th in the, uh, when I first discovered Minoan architecture, uh, I, I found out that uh, modern day um, architects who are building for earthquake prone areas like the Mediterranean and Japan, look at Minoan architecture to figure out how they kept their buildings so stable. Because yes, the tsunami can knock it over when it's, you know, 17 stories high. Um, but the earthquakes just sort of make them go, eh, okay. Um, but I found out that they had a very extensive water management system um, plumbing that we won't see again in the West until the Victorians in, in the UK. And uh, second floor flushing toilets. Um, we, there's one still extant in Akrotiri. Uh, I have a, I went to Akrotiri last uh, November and I took a picture of the toilet. <laughs> um, it, and it's, it's fascinating. Um, the other thing I really like uh, about them, the, for me, that's the best is they were part of this incredible trade network. And so um, the, the Minoans had stuff from Egypt and stuff from Mesopotamia and stuff from you know ancient India, the Harappans. Um, and the Harappans, uh, they found uh, burials of men who were born and raised in Mesopotamia. They can do that strontium test on the teeth, you know? Um, and so found buried next to native women. And then there's a settlement of, of people from Harappa and in India up in Mesopotamia, and there's Minoan uh, pottery over there, and then there's Egyptian uh, scarabs in, in on Crete and Akrotiri, and they're clearly all trading with each other. And we, you know, so we can look at that and go, okay, there we see the, the solid goods, you know, we see the, the tin ingots that are in the shape of uh, the Minoan shapes of ox hides, and we find them in Mesopotamia, and we, we you know, find this here and this here and this here and that here and there. And that means that there's all this cultural exchange going on. And so what, what were they exchanging? You know, not just, you know, not just people traveling, not just trading pottery and, and other, you know, solid goods, but what kind of foodstuffs were they sharing or spice? 
but saffron was a huge thing for the Minoans and they sold it everywhere. I mean, well, they're growing it all the time. We have frescoes of them growing it and picking it. So where are they trading it? We don't know. We can assume so because it's doesn't take a lot of room and it's incredibly precious. Um, but where did it go? Where did they go? What did they bring back? You know, what did they bring back besides trade goods or maybe slaves? We don't know. Um, and all those skill sets. There's just so much possibility besides having toilets. <laughs> toilets would be good. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, they found they found they found these terracotta pipes that have the have the residue of being sulfuric volcanic water embedded into the walls of the of the palaces and buildings. They have hot water. I could I can have hot water anytime I want. It's historical. <laughs> Noise. <laughs> Sarah. Almost. Well I love I really love the relative freedom that, that women had during the, the Roman era, albeit with limitations. Uh, most women could could go about their business uh, pretty well. Similarly, the, the provinces were really granted a, a, a great deal of freedom in, in traditions or relig religions uh, during the Roman occupation, which probably explains why it, it all fell apart so quickly after the armies receded. The other thing that I find really interesting uh, to study about the fifth century is, is all of that beautiful infrastructure. Yes, the baths and we have communal to toilets and it, it was getting to be far too expensive to, to keep those in repair if if the even if you could find the workmen who had the knowledge to do it so so that that wonderful extension of of culture and knowledge and and this the slow ebb and of uh, in a way is really interesting to me yeah thank you <clears throat> and for me i think my favorite part of this era is that it's a period of transition, you know, and they're they're trying to preserve uh, what they can of the Roman political structure, uh, a lot of the Roman um, uh, law, but really coming through the lens of that Germanic law and the Germanic tradition. So it was just a really interesting melting pot because you had so many different peoples, um, you know, under that Germanic. Germanic um, umbrella. You had the Alans, the Visigoths, and the uh, you had the Lombards. You know, so you had a lot of you had a lot of different peoples um, in that in that time period. And it was just kind of fascinating to look at how trade um, it was was happening at the time because, like like Sarah said, you know things are starting to be disrupted. Uh, the trade routes uh, at this time period. So the things that were traded become a little bit more precious because the trade routes weren't as secure as as they were. So it's just kind of a melting pot time and I'm just fascinated by the diversity of the era. So the next question is, what do you find most difficult about researching in this time period? Probably for the Minoans, it's that there's so much we don't know and we don't have the context to try to know. Um, we can't read their language. Um, it is currently untranslated. We don't really have enough um, examples to actually translate it, uh, translate linear A. Linear B is, um, some people will call it, it's late Minoan, but it's, 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 it's Greek, and linear A is not Greek. But linear B stole so many of the symbols for the same stuff that, that you know, we can look at the pictograph and say, hey, this is about um, sheep, because this is the sheep that the Mycenaeans use, and this is the same symbol in the Minoans, so this is about sheep, and they stole the same number system, so this says 15 sheep, okay, but we don't know what the language is, 
you know, we just know that's 15 sheep, but whether it's, you know, what, what it's actually saying, we don't know. And then we get to things that aren't inventories, we're, we're completely baffled. Um, and for me, since I focus so much on clothing, um, I think that the, the second complication is that there's so little extant um, textile. I mean, we, we have threads of things. Uh, we, have the, we have the same issue with, you know, things we've stuck on the back of, of bronze, this or that, you know, we can say, hey, they had a tabby weave. Oh, oh, this is a more, this is a herringbone. How exciting. Um, and we know some of their tech that they use, but we can't guarantee that, you know, this stuff was traditionally, you know, I, I chose to make this out of linen and wool, but was it actually? We have fragments. Um, and so I, uh, I discovered this, um, this system to evaluate um, information. It's a possible, plausible, probable, proven. And so proven for the Minoans is so scanty. We have threads of wool, we have tiny bits of fabric, we have a piece of trim, um, or rather the edge of a, of, of a piece of, of fabric. Um, so we're stuck in the possible, plausible, probables. And, you know, whether that was, were they using actual silk or was that an accident? Were they using sea silk or were they just eating the shell? I mean, eating the, the, the sea life in the shell and using the shell for decoration. Um, were they, were they making linen? Were they just getting linen from Egypt? Were they raising sheep for wool or just for snacks? We don't know, you know, it's all very possible, probable, plausible. But so little is proven. And Sarah? Well, I, I've often said that, that studying history is like, putting a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle together when you've got 900 of them missing. Um, the early principate is so well documented. We have, we have so many literary sources. We have so many statues. We have, we've got frescoes from Pompeii and a few other from, from uh, Rome. It, there are there are so many sources that you can document for the early principate, but it, successive invasions in the fifth century really destroyed so much. Uh, we we've got some tantalizing evidence that that the the art and culture was was as rich in the fifth century as it was in in earlier periods. Uh, there are some extant early books. One's called the Codex Virgilianus, which probably may have been uh, constructed in Britain. And there's another uh, codex uh, called the Codex Vaticanus. Uh, there are a few fragments of, of uh, works by fifth century poets, but we've lost so much. So, so trying trying to stitch together how how Roman daily life was in the fifth century, which is what I've always been interested, in, is really a challenge. Um, there are a couple of other sources that I can think of that, that uh, help to fill in those huge gaps. There's a, a beautiful silver casket called the Proiecta casket. It was May, it was found on the Esquiline in Rome, and it's in, it's in fabulously beautiful shape. It's, it uh, probably was given for the wedding of uh, Proyecta, and it's, it's brilliantly replicated with a picture of the married couple on the, the front and uh, several panels of, of the wedding. Um, would love to be able to handle that and, and study it in, in detail. Thank you. Yeah, and I think similarly with with the Merovingian period, um, there there just isn't a lot of extant pieces out there. There are some fabulous pieces, though, and I and I have to 
um, uh, we, we have to give props to the uh, high medieval tradition of reliquaries because a lot of the textiles and garments that survived were surviving because they were put into a reliquary and you know it wasn't open for a thousand years and uh, all of those textiles um, uh, were able to survive but again you know there, there's there's not a lot of of written documentation, you know, we didn't have fashion journalism back then. And we have a lot of what the church was saying people should wear, and sometimes what they shouldn't wear, but they would um, be very helpful and say, you know, they shouldn't dress in the manner of the people of the East. Okay. <laughs> what do they dress like? <laughs> um, and, and so it's, it's just really difficult to get your hands on it. Plus, you know, and this is probably very relevant to both of you, um, archeologists in the 18th and 19th and early 20th century have a lot, a lot to answer for when it comes to textile research. Uh, there was a huge fad in the late, 18th century and early, early 19th century for um, Merovingian pieces. And uh, they basically just went out and raided uh -huh. as many burials as they could find. And you know what they do with, with the textiles? You know, they brush off all of that detrit detritus <laughs> off of the pretty goldy bits. And uh, so they're there were whole graveyards that were dug up um, with, you know, hundreds of graves from that time period that, you know, we have the shiny bits from it, but we don't have textiles from it. And so that, you know, yeah, they have a lot to answer for. Um, I hurt for you. Indiana Jones is not a role model. <laughs> I hurt for you. Oh, that just, this, yeah. Oh God, yeah. sorry. Um, but some of the, you know, some of the best finds were, were from uh, the Saint Denis Cathedral in Rome, where a lot of the, the royal, French royals were buried. And uh, back in 1959, there were some renovations going on and they came across this chamber that they had not really explored before. And that's where they found uh, Arnigan's uh, sarcophagus and uh, found the textiles, but those textiles were very poorly conserved. Part, some of the textiles were glued to board, uh, and then they were stuck in in uh, boxes and basically forgotten for decades. And then in the '90s, they were rediscovered in this box stuffed on a shelf somewhere. And uh, they've, they've gone under, you know, the best conservation that they can, knowing what we know now, but that Samite cuff was what they um, glued to a board. And it's just, you know, they can't do anything with it now, because if they tried to do anything with it, that, that silk would just poof. There was, um, there was a... Um they had the same issue with the textiles from Tut's tomb. They, they, sh they shoved them in some crates and, and stuck them in the Egypt, Egyptian museum. And they just sat there from, from excavation time to probably about maybe 15 years ago when uh, um, the, Cent the Center for Textile Research decided, hey, whatever happened to that? And they went down there and, you know, stuff sitting in boxes that covered in dust, you know, and they, they pick them up and, and the fabric falls apart, you know, because it's, you know, three thousand years old, and it's been sitting in a in a in a crate since nineteen twenty odd. You know, and and so they they try to recreate these garments, and they're like, well, we took our stab at it, but some of them, you know, were the stuff that the original tomb robbers, you know, used to wrap up the stuff they were taken out when they got caught, and so the priests just grabbed the stuff and shoved it in <laughs> random boxes. So it wasn't even folded right to start with, you know, it's just this wrinkled up stuff crammed into a corner somewhere. And uh, yeah, and just reading the original 
reading the finds from the, the textile center where, yeah, we found it like this and it was like this. And I just cringed like, oh, like gluing a Samite cuff to a piece of cardboard. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How the Victorians ruined everything. Exhibit 519. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so the next question is, uh, what would you tell someone just starting out to study that studying your, your era? Um, for the Minoans, look at the publication date of whatever you're looking at. I mean, if it starts with a 19 digit, it's too old. Um, we've learned so much since the turn of the century. Um, the new technology has let us see things um, that we otherwise never have known. Um, there were a whole bunch of incredibly sexist interpretations of, so the thing with the Minoans is there's that statue, the statue with their boobs out and everyone just sort of, you know, giggles behind their hands. <laughs> oh, look at the boobies, <laughs> boobies, <laughs> boobies. And seriously, it's it's a religious posture. It's like the Pope walking around like this all the time. Um, so that thing needs to die in a fire. Um, but look look at the date, see how old your research is, and if it starts with nineteen something, ditch it. It's it's way way too old. Our understanding is way different. Um, even the sort of sideways interpretation of what we have of uh, Minoan text of Linear A. And what we see in related cultures where they're they're trading things, the interpretations are way different. Um, and we have new digs and we have new tech and, um, yeah, just check your check your sources, check them three times. Um, if it's on the internet, um, yeah, unless it's got an archaeologist's name attached to it, it don't. Don't. And a lot of the YouTube videos, so, unless it's Dr. Bernice Jones uh, doing the interpretation of what the clothing looks like, I would take that with an entire basket of salt because a lot of people are doing it for the shock value and it's the research isn't there. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Sarah, what would you tell someone just starting out? Um, Look at every everything you can from the fourth and fifth centuries, and there there isn't a lot given what I said about uh, the dearth of evidence. Uh, there are I mentioned mosaics. There's a fabulous uh, site called the Piazza Armarina, which has it's a hunting lodge basically. So it has a whole lot of of brilliant mosaics of daily life in the fourth century uh, and you see a whole lot of of uh, men mostly wearing those coptic tunics hunting and and dining and that that villa is where we get the the women with in with the two bras and and the the loincloths playing playing harpasta a ball game Lots and lots of sources there. I think I mentioned Piazza uh, uh, Santa Maria Maggiore. Um, those those are contemporary mosaics of, of people depicted wearing wearing clothing of the era. Um, Metropolitan Museum of Art has a fabulous, complete, pretty much completely intact tunic called the the uh, Dionysus tunic. Um, you can you can go on the website and zoom right in and see all of of the embroidery motifs the, with those classical motifs that I talked about. Uh, I've got a nice little book uh, which is is old, which just has plates of fragments of, of Coptic embroidery. The, those those are really lovely to to give you inspiration. Uh, not a whole lot is you know, being written about late antiquity. Uh, I think it's it's 
it's growing in, in interest, but it just doesn't have the sexiness that that the classical realm does. And the, the, something something else that's worth uh, pursuing is, especially if if you want to to replicate the look, there are some reenactment groups out there. Uh, one is Fectio in Britain and uh, 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 and uh, Dutch. Uh, and another one called Com Comitatus. Uh, there's a fellow on on Facebook uh, who who goes by Flavia Stilicho, who is doing fabulous recreations and 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 uh, research on on the period for militaria. So there there's sources out there, but you have to work for them. Yeah, I think that that's one of the the. The things that I'm very jealous about uh, people that study later periods of Renaissance on, you know, they have painters who paint it, you know, the lace right down to the single thread. And so I'm so jealous of that. So, you know, for me, telling someone that wants to study the Merovingian period is don't be afraid of looking stuff up if it's in a foreign language, you know, if you're an English speaker, uh, Google Translate can get you. 95% of the way there. It'll tell, you know, it'll help you find out if it's linen or if it's silk and that kind of thing. And then you can work it out on, on your own. And the other thing I would highly recommend if people are studying the Merovingian period is they take a pilgrimage to the Shell Museum just outside of Paris that has um, the biggest collection of extant Merovingian garments. It's, it's about 15, 20 minutes by train outside of Shell, and it's a tiny little museum, tiny, tiny little museum. It's in an old abbey, and um, they have uh, Bertil's tunic, which has a sleeve with some tablet weaving. Uh, they have Batilde's um, overgarment that has the embroidery that uh, mimics the beautiful Byzantine jeweled and pearled collars. Uh, when she became, went from a, being a queen to an, an abbess, she could no longer wear the jewels that she was used to be wearing. So she had her ladies embroider the jewelry on this, on this garment. Uh, there's also a, a half circle cape or a half circle um, cloak that has this beautiful wool fringe on it. And there is another um, cape that is a um, piled fabric that has these tufts of wool in it. And that's another fabric that I would love to be able to recreate. And then they have several examples of some really beautiful tablet weaving um, from the era. So my recommendation, if you're studying the Merovingian period, don't be afraid of you know, finding those languages that you may not speak because there are tools to help you out these days and go to Shell so you can actually see the, the very few garments that we still have available. You can, you can literally get right up next to them and, and just, they let you sit there and, and look at them for hours and hours and hours. Um, ask me how I know. <laughs> uh, my, I've been there twice. And both times my camera malfunctioned and the images didn't come out. Everything else in the trip, beautifully, beautifully done. For some reason, my cameras do not like that place. <laughs> oh, that was, that was, yeah, that was I think, sad. I think the spirits of the place want you to keep coming back. I think that's what it is. There's a it's there's a beautiful park nearby. So what I like to do is is you know go to the museum, go to the go to the grocery store, pick up some bread and some cheese and some wine, and go to the park and eat. And then I go back to the museum. They are so thrilled that people want to come see it. And it was funny because when the first time I went there, um, I I couldn't find it because you know I was looking for a museum. <laughs> I was looking for a museum and this is tiny little building that you know you would not think housed one of the world's best collection of Merovingian textiles and they were just like you came from America 
to go come here? <laughs> it's like, yes, yes, I did. <laughs> I, I came from America to this museum because that's, you guys have quite an impressive collection. That's your jam. That's my, that was my jam. And, you know, the food wasn't bad. <laughs> oh, I do love French, French street food, Italian street food. Oh, now I'm getting hungry again. <laughs> so I added a question. Um, what's your unicorn? What is it that you want to find? Okay, so I'll explain it and I'll, I'll tell you what my unicorn is. Spin patterned fabric. This is where you use the S twist and the Z twist to create patterns. And I cannot find this anywhere. And, and it's, it was one of the more common ways of getting, you know, linen kind of fancied up. And it was used extensively in the period to give texture to linen. Because, you know, back then you couldn't dye linen like we can now. And apparently it was, you know, it was, it was in common use, but I can't find it anywhere. So for me, it would be a spin patterned linen, linen fabric. Julia, have you figured yours out? Well, pretty much. When the, and I, I, I mentioned, I'm really interested in daily life, all, all, all aspects of it. One of the most frustrating things about studying Roman daily life is we know that music and dance was was a huge part of of their lives yet we don't have anything but a few fragments and and a wonderful grave Stella in 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 Turkey with a complete song it's a short song and there are there are few offerings at Delphi uh, that are noted, but I I I need a, a song and dance book to just fall out of of a grave somewhere. For for me, I think it would be some actual an actual textile not you know the edge of a of a textile or some carbonized threads or you know the residue that's been annealed to the back of a of, of a of a bronze pin or a platter but some actual textile so we can see whether you know is there cotton in it is there silk in it we think it's linen we know it's a bast fiber. It's just the holy grail would be, you know, this is a textile and it was used for this. And here it is, and we can test it and we can find things out. And um, yeah. And it'd be even more of like magic pie in the sky if it had some sort of, you know, embellishment on it. Hey, it was beaded, it was embroidered, it has weaving texture, it has. Yeah. Tell me more about, is it actually flotaki? I mean, is is uh, is that actually a, a textile? A flocati, sorry, I always get that mixed up. Flocati, you know, is that actually a textile they had? No, no, I wanna know. That would be in my pie in the sky. Yeah, I think that we need to invent safe time travel where we're not actually in the place physically, but we can go observe. So I just want to steal things from the past and bring them to the present. Thank you. Well, there is that too. Yeah. Like you're not going to need that dress. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wear I like it. It. <laughs> and the jewelry. And the food. Oh yes. The food, yes. Okay, so that's the that's the last of my questions. Do you guys have any questions you want to ask of the others? What do you think is the um I don't know the if you've seen other other folks do this this research, what's the what's the most common pitfall that you that you think people researching in, in your area 
stumble into most reliably or unreliably, as it were? I, I think basing a lot of what they think the dress was on outdated um, Victorian concepts. Damn the Victorians. <laughs> I think a lot of people have a hard time saying, I don't know, mm. when they're researching. Um, uh, and I probably started out that way myself. Uh, especially the more you do it, the more you want to be at least your own expert. But it's I've, I've I've occasionally seen people get a little rigid in their thinking when they're approaching uh, the Roman era, and it's really important to say this is this is what I think they're doing in this particular time period. But the 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 more the more you paint yourself into a corner by 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 making absolute statements for things that that again we've got so many jigsaw places puzzle pieces missing here. Give yourself a little wiggle room to to be ignorant because that's the door to knowledge. So here's a question for you. We we hadn't talked about it before, but I think that this would be very helpful to people just starting out. Who are the experts in your area? Who should people be listening to? Um, it's I have to say there's there's only a couple in in um, in my field. Probably the premier is going to be uh, Dr. Bernice Jones. Uh, she uh, she's actually done the experimental archaeology that's moved beyond theory. Um, also, um, we have uh, Stella Spentidiki, I think I'm pronouncing that correct. I can spell these things, but um, who has actually done also more experimental archaeology on textiles in the in the Aegean. Um, there's a couple of other, Brent, uh, Burke. Um, oh gosh, let me see, where are my books? Uh -huh. And uh, of course, the uh, um, the exhibits uh, from Dumas, uh, who's the current chief of excavations at Akrotiri. Um He did this amazing overview of most of the the more glamorous of the frescoes. And so, if you have those. The work of those four people, uh, you're pretty well covered. Uh, let's see, Anne Shaw also um, has done a, a bunch of uh, of work in it, and uh, Chapman and Shaw they do a lot of stuff together. But I would start with Jones, Bernice Jones, and uh, Spantidiki, um, and then look at the frescoes yourself, look at the statuettes yourself, look at the votive dresses yourself. Um, yeah, make your own interpretations from there. You may agree, you may disagree. There's things I disagree with them on too. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I, I turned around and pulled some books off the shelf, which is the easiest way for me to remember uh, names and titles. Uh, I would really recommend anybody who is is interested in this this huge transitional period to go out and uh, borrow or buy Peter Heather's Empires and Barbarians. The Fall of Rome and the Birth of Europe. Excellent, excellent, very thorough uh, study of, of this tremendously uh, changing pro work. <laughs> um, another one, Peter Brown, The World of Late Antiquity. Uh, it's, it's a shorter read, um, uh, very nice. Uh, the Roman Empire divided 400 to 700. I'll just flash the book covers. By John Moorhead. Let me see if I can. Okay. There is the Roman Empire divided. There's the world of late antiquity. There's Peter Heather's Empires and Barbarians. And, Barbarians. and one other one that I really love 
It's edited by Paul Vane called A History of Private Life. Ooh. Oh, that's an interesting series, yes. I highly recommend that if you, you it, it's, it's, you know, honestly, it's hard to get into the heads of people who lived 80 years ago. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's really, really difficult to get into the heads of, of people who lived in ancient times. But this, that's what this book is attempting to do. It's a good book. I've had that one myself. Yeah, and for me, this is one that I just got recently. Um, and put it in front of your face. It's the only time it's in focus. It's really annoying. Oh. Uh, <laughs> oh no. It's all yeah. It's it's blurred. Well, it's trying. Okay, so it's the handbook. Okay, so you got to see my my messy background. I'm just going to turn off the blur okay. so that uh, y'all can see it. I'm in the process of uh, doing some sewing projects. So it, everything is kind of everywhere. So this Beautiful is uh, the Merovingian world. Oh, nice. And it covers a lot of the politics and the social history of the period. So that's really, I mean, it's, it's so dense. I've only gotten a third of the way through it. Um, but um, Patrick Perrin, who was a French researcher, did a lot of the late 1900 research, early 2000 research. So anything by Patrick Perrin um, is really good. And they recently did a book with Egan Wommers, Wommers uh, from Germany. Um, this is on uh, some of the Saint-Denis, the Shells, Frankfurt and, and Maine um, finds, and also from the Col Cologne Museum. Uh, they have some tremendous finds from there. And, and so, those are two of them that are really good. And some of the other uh, researchers that um, are, are doing some really interesting work with textiles and out of the, the uh, Center for Textile Research, uh, you have Antoinette Rest Eicher, you have Sophie de Razier um, and Bonnie Efros doing a lot of really interesting uh, work. So if you have those people, uh, you have a pretty good basis of what's known right now. Oh, I pulled one book out since I mentioned it earlier, Early Decorative Textiles. Ooh. Plates of finds going back to classical times. See if... No, it doesn't want to. <laughs> nope. But trust me on this. Okay. Also, this is the one that told me about the uh, the toilets and the uh, um, the architecture. Fascinating stuff, mm. right? And uh, then remember, I said that uh, stuff is always changing. Yeah, book on the newest stuff. So that was my indulgence to myself for my birthday. <laughs> so I think I need to have you guys back, and we can bring our book collections. Right, it's like this one and this one and this one. Now, this is an old one, but it's got this one picture that I can't find anywhere else, so I've kept it. Yeah, we need. A, we, I think we need to do that. That would be a lot of fun. We just go through our bookshelves. Like, here's the stuff on that little field, and here's all the context stuff. Oh, and here's oh, stuff, yeah, you know, before and after because you can't really understand what you are unless you look before it. <laughs> we have a problem. It's a good problem. <laughs> It's a happy problem. Yeah. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad we picked up the books. Yeah, like I said, I think we need to have a show and tell. I think that, that would be a heck of a lot of fun, because I have way more books downstairs. Um, and like I said, you know, when I said, "Don't be afraid of foreign languages," well, the, you know, this is in German. Um, I've got three or four books in German. I've got another three or four books in French. You know, there's some Polish um, publications out there. There's Italian, there's Spanish, there's all kinds of um, resources that you just can't be afraid of, of the fact that they're not in English. Yeah, some of yourself. mine are, are like the book, the, the gatherings of papers from various symposiums, you know, symposia, symposia. Um, and so there's, you know, there's, there's English papers and then there's 
there's, you know, in the Greek alphabet, Greek in the Greek alphabet, and then there's French and German, and I think there's a couple of Dutch ones too. But yeah, you just, um, Egyptian, I think there's one in Egyptian, um, Arabic. But yeah, you just, you know, run it through Google Translate. Bless you, Google Translate. It's, uh, it's not perfect language, but it'll get you there. Yeah, eventually. Thank you. This was fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was.